You know, the Lord says that in, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 15, of course, you know, I've quoted a lot of scriptures already. You know, I, so, some people say to me, wow, that was a really good message. Well, all I really try to do is just take verses of scripture by the Holy Ghost and weave them together. I gave myself to this as a, as a young man. I would just write, I would practice just writing page after page after page of just weaving scriptures together. Because I just want, they're in there, you, you, you can't do anything for you. I can't do anything for you, huh? You can't do anything for anybody else. But Christ Jesus has got all the solutions. He's got all the answers. He's got all the liberation. He's the one who's come to rescue us, redeem us. He's the one who's come to keep us by his own power. Jesus, Jesus said, Father, keep through your own power, your own name, those that you gave unto me. That's some keeping power, isn't it? Man, I'm good to go. I know that. So I think that what happens is you listen to the lies and the situation and the circumstances, and you just think that God's far, far away. Don't think that ever again. If you've called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been made a new creation. You've been made a new creature. And he's come to live on the inside of you. He's right here. There's a wellspring already, always there, ready to just supply to you. There, there's a wellspring. There's a gift of God. There's the living presence of the living God on the inside of us, ready to supply to us. We're going to have to get in the faith, though, to do it. Yeah. If you think God's somewhere far, far away on another planet, that ain't the faith. And if it ain't the faith, nothing's going to happen. You, you can hope all you want, nothing's going to happen. You know, people go from hope to belief to belief to faith. Hopefully they don't get stopped along the way. You know what I'm saying. So many people get stopped along the way. Belief just can't seem to ever get it. Huh? Hope wants it but can't have it, as it were. Huh? Hope wants it but it's just not there. Belief can't ever seem to catch up with it, but faith possesses it. Faith just possesses it. And God, the Holy Ghost, has come to supply us faith. Somebody said, I just feel terrible. I just don't have the faith to move forward today. Guess what? The Holy Spirit, if you would just allow him to begin to influence you, to begin to influence your emotions and your thinking and your heart and your appetite, every dimension of your life. He supplies faith. That's one of the evidences that he's around. We read about the fruits of the Spirit, and we just look at it like, wow, what is that? That's what he's giving you on a daily basis continually. That's the life of God. That's the life of Jesus Christ. That when the Lord said for us to deny ourselves, he's talking to us about losing our own life so that we can live the life of Jesus, to be endued with the life of Jesus, to be endued with every good thing. To be blessed with every spiritual blessing to the heavenly realm. My goodness. To be overwhelmed continually with the goodness of God. To have everything that pertains to life and godliness being supplied continually. And you want that whatever it is. This situation, that doubt, that unbelief. That sin, that iniquity. Listen, the Lord will teach you to love only Him. He'll teach you to desire only holy emotions. He'll teach you to seek those pleasures that are at His right hand. Satan and his influence, his demonic influence, has got man to see believing that all pleasures, huh, that all exciting things are found within the realms of sin and iniquity. They're not. That's the garbage can. That's worse than that. That's the sewage. Huh, that's sunk down into the mire. And I'm not talking about just any kind of mire. I'm talking about the sewage. That's sunk down into the sewage up to your, right up to, the, to your nose. What a hectic life. I would look, I would be bummed out. I'd be, I'd be walking around looking all sad and sorrowful too. <laughs> Hallelujah. He came set to be free. I want you to notice that, I want you to notice something in Galatians chapter 6 verse 15. The Lord says, all this religious stuff doesn't matter to me. All, all, all this circumcision and uncircumcision, that's not the point. You don't get it. You're not getting it. All that matters to me is a new creation. See, if I was to take you today, this morning, I'm going to do some of it tonight, I believe. But if I would begin to take you through the book of Romans and help you begin to understand that the reality of it is, is there's no possibility of man ever getting set free from sin and destruction but by the miracle of the new birth, suddenly it sets everything in the framework for you so you can properly understand the difference between trusting in the law for righteousness and trusting in the faith of Jesus Christ for righteousness. Because all the law can do is declare to you that you're under the law of sin and death. All the law can do is describe to you that you're still in bondage to a taskmaster and there's no getting rid of it. There's no way. 
unless Jesus Christ came, the most holy and righteous man would have still been for eternity separated from God. I don't care how perfectly he lived. Job, God says he's a perfect man. He would have been eternally separated from God. It, the, God in his mercy made a way for you and I to instantaneously, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, be made right with him. He made a way to where we could instantaneously receive the gift of righteousness, the gift of holiness, be holy and acceptable unto him. So that everything about our life now can be, be you know, subject to him, interact with him. <laughs> and we want to trust in other things. The law can't save you because the law can't deliver you from the power of disobedience and from the power of sin. Only the life and the blood of Jesus Christ can deliver you. Uh, only, only the power that God has granted for us to us by the working of the Holy Ghost. Can you and I have this miracle, instantaneous miracle, where we become a new creation, where we become a new creature? And the Lord says, not by any works of righteousness which we have done. He instantaneously makes us a new creation. Hallelujah. Old things are passed away. Yes. Everything is new. But that's the faith. What if we don't believe it? It ain't going to work. That's right. It won't work. That's right. People are stuck not believing it. It's too, it's too amazing. Oh, I just can't believe that it would be that easy, that it would be that much of a gift. When we talk about the righteousness which is by faith, that you can take that, that, that righteousness which is by faith apart from what Jesus did for us at Calvary. If you say, well, it's by faith. Well, what do you mean it's by faith? What we mean is that Jesus Christ came as the last Adam. Adam Represented all mankind, and through Adam, all mankind came under the law of sin and death, became the prisoners of darkness. Christ Jesus came to live out a life, now to be the new representative of man. This is Romans chapter 5, to be the new representative of man. So that everyone who would believe in him would have the privilege and the opportunity of instantaneously receiving the miracle life of God by him. That's the faith. That's the righteousness that comes by faith. What kind of righteousness? A righteousness that is all embedded and found and discovered in being made a new creation. People want to have a righteousness which is by faith without focusing on what the faith did. The faith Jesus said. If you want to come in, you've got to be born again. You've got to be born of the Spirit. Paul takes that another step and helps us to understand it over and over again. But ultimately you see how he weaved the Old Testament scriptures within the network, as it were, of, or within the concepts of what it means to be born again when he said the Lord would take and write his laws and his ways upon our heart and upon our minds so that we would do them. Isn't that amazing? And that he's created us anew. He takes us, it's like, it's like God created us all in Adam, you know. He took Adam from the fine dust of the earth and he shaped him and he made him a living being. And out of that, all the nations of humanity came forth. Then we read Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24 and we see how the Lord takes us. And he takes us right down and he shapes us and makes us anew. Each one, he comes to each one of us now. And he makes us anew. And he recreates us in righteousness and true holiness. And he says, think differently about yourself. People want to just say, well, you got to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Well, you know what that is? You need to think different. That's what that means. Let me just lay it out for you. I mean, I can honestly translate this from the Greek and just simply to say, think different about yourself from here on out. Stop, stop thinking the way you've been thinking. There's a new faith. There's a new realm of thinking. There's a new way of believing. There's a new way of acting. The Lord says, be not conformed to this world, but be transfigured by thinking different. Somebody says, how do I renew my mind? Because it just gets kind of all categorized in the renewing of the mind. Well, you, then, then you'll hear people say, well, you need to read the word of God. And that's good. I, I agree with you. That's good. 
But what will that ultimately result in? You're thinking different. Because if you read the Word of God, you know what? It's, the Word of God is going to be telling you things that's different from what's going on in your life right now. And you got a choice. Are you going to believe about all the things that are going on around you? Are you going to believe what God said? Because if you believe what God said, He's promised to perform His Word, to watch over His Word, to perform it. He's promised that He's going to be a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. You're not going to be without everything that is pertaining to His good pleasure about your life. He would say, well, I'm going to do an experiment with God and see if it works real quick. <laughs> well, you know, look at baby. <laughs> this is our little sweet darling. <laughs> I don't see her straining to grow. <laughs> she's just happy. She's happy right where she's at. Praise God. She's happy. She loves to eat. Look at those. Like, she loves to eat. She, she wants to be in the big middle of everything. If you set her aside anywhere, she's going to be screaming and hollering. She's got to be around the folks. She wants to be in the big middle, the center of attention. Hey, that's it. Look, I, I hope that today that you'll become very satisfied with the reality that God so loved you, he gave his only begotten son for you. That Christ Jesus so loves you that he was willing to suffer, bleed, and die for your, for your sake. That he went down into hell so you never have to go to hell. I'm never going to hell. Christ Jesus went down into hell for me. Hallelujah. Rose again with the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He's my Savior. I'm put all my trust in him. You trust in whatever you want. Some people trust in horses. Some in chariots. Some trust in this thing. Some trust in that thing. Some trust in their own human ability or, or whatever, the counsel of men. But come on now. Begin to put your trust in Christ Jesus. Begin to put your trust in his word. Begin to put your trust in the working of the Holy Ghost. I mean, Father in his mercy gave us the two dearest things to himself. And, and making us ready for one day he's going to come. The new Jerusalem will come down out of heaven. It's going to happen. And Father's going to come and rule and reign over all this earth. He's going to gird his sword upon his side in the not too distant pre future. And he's going to bring an end to all this stuff. He's going to come like a fuller soap and he's going to cleanse it. He's going to come like a refiner's fire and who will be able to abide the day of his coming. He's going to come and rule with a rod of iron and smash everything. Yeah, he is. And I'm saying even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Right now, he's a refiner's fire in my life. He's a fuller soap in my life. He's ruling with a rod of iron right now because I said, Jesus Christ, Lord, Savior, Almighty God, come rule over me. Yeah. Holy Ghost, you rule me. Yeah. Now, I know exactly what he's going to do because he told me. <laughs> and he told you. Each one of us have a choice. We can either cooperate with what God is saying or we can go our own way. Going our own way has been proven again and again to not result in any good thing. Okay? God's word, however, has been proven again and again never to fail and to bring the blessings and to bring the riches of life. Hallelujah. For everyone who wants it. For everyone who will receive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a choice. You sit around and feel bad about yourself. I've had five husbands. <laughs> five. How could God love me? Well, the, problem, the issue is he loves you. God in his mercy and his grace gave us his only begotten son, who is the eternal word, who is, as it were, hidden in his bosom. Man in his plight, in, and inescapable it does not matter how perfect he lives it does not matter what he does there is no way of escaping the spirit of a disobedience that came upon all men because all have sinned because of Adam's disobedience through the obedience of one Christ Jesus is the only means by which you and I get liberated out of that as much as we didn't choose 
voluntarily to be a part of Adam's sin, now much more choosing to be a part of Jesus Christ's obedience. We are liberated from Adam's transgression, now to be set over into Christ Jesus' righteousness. You choose. You can sit around and think about all your past and all your failures and all your problems and all your issues and all your needs. Or you can look to the one who supplies all your needs. You can begin to get in the realm of faith. Faith will produce a miracle for you. The word of God sets you up for the faith that then ultimately results in a miracle by default. Yes, sir. The word is a choice. Am I going to do it? If I do it, that's the faith. It sets me, sets me right into the faith. Huh? Now I begin to move with God. What did God say? People have, got a, people have got a false faith. It's an antichrist faith to sin more or less every day. Man, you should want to walk perfect before him every day. Amen. Huh? Somebody said, are you perfect? No, but I want to be. That's right. I am in a certain way because I am complete in him. He just, I'm in him. Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Somebody say, you tell me you never sin? Hey, I don't want to sin. Huh? I'm telling you, I know that the thought of sin isn't sin. You understand me? The thought of sin isn't sin. Because if the thought of sin was sin, Jesus couldn't have been tempted. Right. And he was tempted in every way where we're tempted. So the way we are tempted. Mm -hmm. huh? But even though I have the thought of it, I still say, Lord, forgive me. I don't want to have that thought. Right. I just don't even want it. Even though I know it's not sin, I just say, Lord, I don't even want that. Please forgive me. Just, I, 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 you know, every one of us have to deal. We, we deal on a daily basis with what people used to have to go into a house of ill repute to see 100 years ago. Yes. Because women are, have lost their modesty. Men have lost their modesty. It's just, it's just smeared everywhere. Then you go take to another level of exposure, the television, and we know what the media is designed to do in, movie, in the movie formula is to, to create within that framework. They, they believe sin sells, so they create a lot of lasciviousness. Okay, and we... And, and we just figure, well, we want some entertainment. You can't get entertained out of hell. You can't take fire into your bosom and not be burned, dear people. And then it goes to another level. You got Now we have the Internet. We have our smartphones. And these guys are brilliant at trying to create these ads. Huh. Now what are you going to do? You're going to have to, you're going to have to be willing to let the Word of God define boundaries for you. To where you say, you recognize that's the realm of death. That's the realm of sin and iniquity. That's the disobedience. People every day, I want to put it to you this way. People every day are having the choice of whether they're going to go and disobey God in the same similar way that Adam did and take of a forbidden fruit That's right. and participate with sin and iniquity. And yet the Lord here, the difference between you and I and Adam is that he gives us another chance. He gives us another day to get it right. He gives us another day to get it right. He gives us another day to get it right. He gives us another day to get it right. Isn't that amazing? And the blood of Jesus Christ, so long as we're serious. So long as for, we're for real in our heart, we'll cleanse us. Now remember, if you walk in the light as he's in the light, then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you. People think that they can walk in darkness and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you. And that's not true. If you walk in the light as he's in the light, you have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you. If you confess your sins, then he's faithful and just to forgive you, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. This, I want you to think about this because this is the way it goes down. It is, it's not the way it, that people preach it, but I mean it's the blood sacrifice the provision that God has given to you and me through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, his blood that's not lose, lost one iota of its power, that cleanses us and washes us and, 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 and keeps us. All we've got to do is be willing, but some place in time, we've got to get it right. So th there can be an attitude of, Lord Jesus, wash me, cleanse me in your blood, and I'm just going to go do it again because we're all sinners. We're all going to sin every day. You're going to sin every day. Your heart's going to be hardened. If you're going to just take sin as a, for granted as something that's common, how then are you going to be convicted by the one who's come to convict us of sin and then repent so you can get cleansed? Because people have bought into a lie, and now they're, they move, they're moving past Holy Ghost conviction because they're taking it as commonplace. They have accepted it and confessed it that it is a part of their life. Sin is not a part of my life. Sin is not a part of my life because the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all sin. Sin is not a part of my life. I've been delivered. I've been delivered from the power of death and sin. I've been brought into the spiritual laws of life by Christ Jesus who delivered me from the power of the law of sin and death. 
Now I've got to be have a different heart about things. I've got to have a different commitment about a, a, the thing. I've got to have a different faith realm about the thing. I'm going to learn. Father, I thank you for your mercy and your grace because we're going to, I'm going to get this right by you. Yes. Not by my own ability, but by that ability which you give. Well, you know, there's a lot of talk going on right now, and I just really feel I need to spend time ministering on it, that because there is no law, then there is no transgression. Because there is no law, sin is not reckoned. It's totally taking the scripture completely out of context and wrestling it to one's own destruction. It's taking, it's taking Romans 3.20, Romans 5.13. I think the other one is Romans 4.19. Completely out of context. You've got to keep everything within the picture, you, uh, and, and within the context. You've got to keep it within the context of what Paul said previously. If the nations uh, keep the law by nature, then it's proved that the law has already been written upon people's hearts. Huh? Somebody says, well, well there's God, sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Were you talking about the law of Moses? Because I'm going to tell you right now, God reckoned sin and pay, all elderly people were responsible for sin before Moses. Look at the, I'll just back up to the Amorites. I don't have to back up that far. Are you listening to me? Yes. Just look, but if we could back up to the Amorites to the days of Abraham, then, you know, we could just work our way back. I like the big one. I like to come out with the big one after, you know, if I had a little bit more time to build it to a crescendo and convince you before I ever get to the big one of how that God held people responsible for their sin and there was a judgment. Huh? But I'm telling you, he destroyed the whole earth because of sin. He flooded it with a great deluge because of sin and iniquity. He would wrestle the scripture to their own destruction. Adam. <laughs> Come on. You didn't tell me there was a, that the, Moses, the Mosaic law was there when Adam was in the garden? No, there was, the Mosaic law wasn't there. But was there a law there? There's always been a law. There's always been a law. And... You know, Paul's arguing from the point of, listen, there's nothing that can set you free but Jesus Christ. Even the law, all it can do is point to the fact that you are continually with that, in a state of sin. You're continually in a place that doesn't please God. The law is there to declare the transgression. And I want to just kind of wrap this up here this morning by just turning your attention. You know, although there's many things to say, and I, I know that if you study this I bet you've probably got a lot of questions that I haven't answered for you. And I want to answer them because if we can't answer them perfectly, I believe that anybody who ends up with a contradiction in Scripture, they've got an evidence that their doctrine is wrong because the Word of God doesn't have contradictions. Somebody said there's contradictions in the Bible. I just simply say because you believe it wrong, man. Yeah, there's contradictions in the Bible. All you got to do is believe it wrong. <laughs> And you'll have all kinds of contradictions. But you believe it right, ain't no contradictions. Amen. Amen. It just jumped into wrong conclusions. Look with me in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. How many of you know that Paul, the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John were on the same page? Does anybody, anybody got a problem with that? Did anybody got a problem with that? They were on the same page. They were speaking by the same spirit. Hello. Oh, that's what John said. Well, give me a break. Is this what John said versus what Paul said? Are they all speaking expressly by the Holy Ghost? Are they all speaking on behalf of Jesus? See, I don't believe. I'm a theologian that doesn't believe that nonsense. I believe that God's word comes right out of the heart of the Father, and it was just delivered by different vessels. One was Paul. One was John. And besides that, you know, if you want to run, you know, people want to get into some contradictions, and they do all the time. My goodness, you can, you can people derive one conclusion from Romans concerning what Paul said about faith, and then they're going to get another conclusion from, the, from uh, Ephesians, what he says about faith, because they're trying to believe it wrong. Look, can I make it real simple for you? Listen, faith is the new birth. Faith is the new creation. Faith is having been delivered from the power of sin and disobedience that came upon all men because of Adam's sin. That's faith. That's the faith. 
What is the law? The law is the proof that you're in bondage. That's all the law is. The law is, is a place of covenant that says, look, it's a bondage covenant. It really is. It's a declaration of bondage. It's the, it's the commandment of God. And this is what Paul says in Romans chapter 7. It's the commandment of God. It's just. It's good. It's holy. But nonetheless, it's the ministry of condemnation. That's what he said then in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are you tracking with me? It's the ministry of condemnation. What are we in the ministry of right now? In the same chapter, what are we in the ministry of? 2 Corinthians chapter 3. What are we in the ministry of? Go ahead, be bold, say it. Thank you. Just be bold. You go ahead and, you know, when I'm asking for a dialogue, go ahead. We're in the ministry of righteousness now. What's being ministered to us by God right out of heaven? You righteous. Whoa! <laughs> now, now, before his ministry was, you condemned because of Adam's sin and transgression. You unhold till a redeemer comes. A redeemer has to come. This is why we get so excited about the Redeemer when we start saying, I'm redeemed, I'm ransomed, I've been bought, I've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. And that's the faith. Do you believe it? It's big enough to get you through any problem, any situation, any condemnation, any guilt, any sense of failure, whatever. It's big enough to get you through any sickness and disease and, and sin or iniquity. It'll deliver you, set you free, loose you. And there is no other faith. There is no other means of provision for men to be made a new creation, holy and acceptable by God instantaneously. Not having to work, not having to strive, not having to go from one level to the next level, not having to somehow, through your efforts, obtain some favor from God. God's grace poured out upon the whole of the human race. But with that grace poured out upon the whole human race, the grace of God that brings salvation, Titus 2.11, has been revealed. Teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live right now righteously and godly. You think Father's lowering his standard about righteousness and godliness? No, it's life. It's life. This is the life of Christ. This is the life of God. This is life. The rest is death. This is all that can last forever. This is all that can bring a blessing. This is all that can bring goodness into your life. This is all that can bless you. All the rest of it is a curse. It's a curse. Men need to have wisdom and insight to recognize that sin is a curse. That participating with demon spirits is to participate with a lie, is to participate with hate, is to participate with everything that that Satan created when iniquity was found in him. I want you to look here at this verse of Scripture. because It's a powerful verse of Scripture. First of all, it's, we're, we're set up. And, and we, you know, the Lord is always setting us up with this because he wants us to see the big picture because people can get lost in the details. The big picture allows you to navigate, to know what to do with the information. I always notice this in school and especially in really difficult, difficult subjects. Huh? Uh, that if you can get the big picture first, then you know where to run with all the little bits and pieces of information. Otherwise, you're just overwhelmed with bits and pieces of information. You don't even know what to do with it. <laughs> you're just swamped. Ouch, I got all this information. I don't know where to put it. By the way, you look at the big picture. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. Now you're made alive. Huh. How? By the work of, of Christ Jesus, by the miracle of salvation. By the fact that you've been made a new creation, nothing counts with God. Not a circumcision, not uncircumcision, but a new creation. All those things were just testifying of the fact that one day Christ Jesus would come. The power of God would work a miracle so that by the circumcision of Christ, the body of the sins of the flesh would be removed from off of us. That he would destroy the body of sin by this crucifixion. You know, you know the scriptures I just quoted? You know, how many of you know the scriptures I just quoted? Colossians 2, 11. I like people that are... I like to just give you a quiz. <laughs> because what? You're going to have to take his word. Your, his word will produce faith. It, his word will produce faith within you. It will keep you. His word. That word, if I kept him, that word if I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. I run into young men because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know who I am. How do I know who I am? The Word of God has taught me who I am. How did I know who Jesus was? Praise God because of the Word. Somebody came preaching the Word. 
My mama came preaching the word to me before I ever came out. And my mom, my mom wasn't interested in teaching me mama. She was e interested in teaching me John 3, 16, for God's love the world. I mean, I'm not kidding you. My mama brainwashed me before I was two years old with the word of God. I'm, I've been washed by the word. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Casa pala teia. Hara sote. Now, I just want to read this passage of Scripture to you because you've got to get it set up properly. And, and, this, and um, oh, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Wow. We weren't sons of God till the, till the new birth. We're not all the children of God. That's not true. Uh-uh. You've got to be born of the Spirit, born of the Word. <laughs> Hallelujah. Born of the resurrection. Hallelujah. And, 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 the Lord, and the Lord goes on to say, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. That's an emphasis, isn't it? Huh? Dearly beloved, all you that are in love, we are the sons of, now are we the sons of God. And it doesn't yet appear what we shall be. Right? This moment doesn't appear. We're looking at you and me, and we see all the frailties, and we saw all the issues and the decompositions and whatnot. Huh? <laughs> We, you know, we see all the, we see all of the, we see all the imperfections, but we know that when we see him, we shall be, we shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him. What? That's a mouthful. If I take, if I take that and I just take that and I do a thesis just on that, that is, I, I, I exegete that. That is, that is intense. That is intense. We can just really easily read past that. Sons of God, Jesus says, you know, of course, in, in um, John chapter 1, verse 14, the Lord says, as many as believe, he gave them the power, right? He gave them authority to be the sons of God. As many as would receive what he had to give, right? Are you with me? Yes. Wow. We have authority to be sons of God. What does that mean? The last son of God mentioned was who? Adam. Adam, and he lost that. And then Jesus, or the first son of God mentioned, forgive me, was Adam. And then all of a sudden, the only begotten son showed up on the scene. The eternal God made flesh. I said the eternal God. Adam, just man, formed from the, formed from the fine dust. We got to watch Father create him. That was his beginning. He want to tell you something else about Adam, just say, that's nonsense. I saw when he was created from the fine dust. We could go to the very moment that he had his beginning. Are you with me? Yes. Christ Jesus he doesn't have a beginning. He came down out of heaven. He became a holy embryo. Ha, 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 ha. Hallelujah. This is a miracle of God. It's the great is the mystery of God. I had Jehovah's Witness say to me, Oh, nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus is God. I said, Hundreds of times. Where should I begin? <laughs> hundreds of times. And he's looking at me like, Well, you're the, first, you're the first person that told me hundreds of times. I said, How many other Christians you talk to? He said, Many. I said, I'm sorry. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. <laughs> Jesus is God all over the place. Hallelujah. He's God in the Old Testament. And he's God in the New Testament too. And he's God in me. He's God in you. He's God here present. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And now the Lord has brought us into that same position. He brought us into that same place through the new creation, not positional salvation. New creation salvation. I said not positional salvation. I said new creation salvation. An experience. Praise God. We've been born of the Spirit. And God has given to us, the, 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 as it were, the second most precious thing to Him. To be with us, to lead us, to help us, to guide us, to strengthen us, to empower us, to show us how to get it done. To be our inspiration, to be our guide inside and outside. Yes. Literally, the Holy Ghost. Yeah. We got the Holy Ghost praying for us. We got Jesus praying for us. And we got Father making intercession for us. If we can't make it, give me a break. He's just saying, how many people are going to choose to go my way, to do it my way, to have my life, to keep my word, to understand that there is a place uh, 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 that I have chosen and I've invited everybody to come in with me and it's the good place. Satan doesn't have the good place. He's got the bad place. Come on into the good place. He leaves it up for us to choose on a daily basis in a whole 
you know, many different, many different categories of life. But if we just come to a conclusion in one category, it will take care of everything. If we just say, I'm a new creation. I'm now in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. I've been given the gift of righteousness and true holiness. I'm done with all the stuff. I'm not in the world even as he's not in the world. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye and pride of life has nothing to do with me. God fathers on the inside of me and his love shed abroad in my heart. I'm going to live here. Now what am I supposed to do? Now what am I supposed to believe about myself now, Lord? I just open up the Bible. And I don't just open it. I give myself continually to it. Because that's where the Holy Spirit can begin to talk to you on another level. Yes. I believe people need to be continually reading from Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, 21. Amen. And it doesn't take you no year to get through it. <laughs> okay, you get through the, just a moderate type of reading. Moderate reading. Moderate, 30 minutes a day or so, and at most an hour a day, you get to the New Testament in 30 days, the whole of the New Testament, the Bi whole Bible, from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, 21, in 90 days. Dear people, these things, these things are, should be commitments of our life. We want the Holy Spirit to talk with us. Yes. Well, he's not going to subjectively talk to us. He talks to us from the Word. I'm, well, I'm going to get talked to by the Holy Ghost one day a week, Sunday morning. Those are, my goodness, those aren't survival rations. You with me? You will die. You will die. If you eat one time a week, you will die. Malnutrition rations. Death rations. Those are torture rations. We're going to feed you. Come on in. We're going to feed you once a week. That's torture. Just give yourself to the things of the Spirit. And then when we, when we look at that, when we look at that verse of Scripture, and we stand in awe, when we see him, we will see him as he is, for we shall be like him. And we've got the same resurrection that Jesus purchased for us, that he demonstrated to us. He's brought us into the oneness with him. He's brought us, we don't exist outside of him, in other words. Which is amazing. Amazing thought. Then he says, everyone who has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. In other words, there's a, there is a giving yourself to making your calling and election certain. That's how Peter said it in 2 Peter chapter 1. Give yourself to make your calling and election certain. Everyone who has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. Come on now. That, isn't, that is no compromise of saying, oh, we just all sinners. Oh, we're going to sin more or less every day. Because after all, you heard what Paul said to the Romans in Romans chapter 3. Don't you, you're taking it out of context. You're taking, the, you're taking, there's none righteous, none, not one, completely out of context now. Paul's just convincing that everybody's in need of, a, he's just declaring from the Psalms that everybody's in need of the Redeemer. Everybody's held under the bondage of sin and death. You're going to tell me now after having been redeemed, you're still the prisoner of sin? Is Jesus Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. Eh? Come on now. This is a good doctrine. Then the next verse of Scripture says, he that, he that sins transgression, transgresses the law. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. New Testament. The law can be activated. As soon as you sin, you activate the law. He that sins transgresses also the law for, for sin is for the law. He that sins transgresses, transgresses, transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And you need to get that. There's a bunch of people right now spewing out a bunch of heresy. And they just never read 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. They never thought about the fact that God held Adam responsible for his disobedience. They never thought about that God held the whole world responsible for their disobedience during the days of Noah. They never thought about all the evil that God judged for their sin and their iniquity prior to the law. For the law's always been there. It's always been there. But then there was a law on Mount Sinai that brought us to a better hope. Huh? <laughs> Hallelujah. It didn't negate the promise. It just, it just, it, it helped people focus on their need for a coming redeemer. Because the law made sin exceedingly sinful. Amen? But the Holy Ghost is doing a better job. I said the Holy Ghost is doing a better job. I'm telling you, you get the spirit of holiness, now you got yourself a real contrast. Huh? You got yourself a real contrast when the spirit of holiness is contra contrasting and comparing. 
everything about this world and all the conduct of the world to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name, I, I pray today that you'll grab a hold of the faith of the new creation. I know it's, I know it's just too big to believe. I know it's just unspeakable gift. How can we possibly believe that this is how God feels about us? Well, he loved you before you. He loved you while you were still dead in your trespasses and sin. He commended his love towards you. If God spared not his own son, but offered him up for the sins of us all, how shall he not also by him freely give us all things? You need to get into that. You with me? Yeah. You need to get into that. You need to get into Romans 8, 32. Maybe you haven't memorized any verse of scripture yet. Memorize that. You know why I like to memorize verse of scripture? I like to walk around with God's thoughts in my head. You know what that is? That's thinking different. I got God's thoughts instead of my thoughts. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what his word. I'd love to sit down and hear what it is he's thinking, what it is he's doing, how he perceives things. It, it isn't, it, this isn't just the writings of men to me. These are the very expressed words of Almighty God come right out of his heart. I get to know the Father there. I get to know Jesus there. I get to know the Holy Ghost there. But Romans 8, 32 is a good verse of Scripture for you to memorize. God spared not us own. He loves me so intensely. He loves you so intensely that he spared not his own son, but offered him up for the sins of us all. How shall he not also by him freely give you all things? Freely give me all things. But what am I going to believe? What am I going to participate with? Because I'm not going to end up with a good result participating with the wrong thing. I'm not going to end up with the right result participating with the wrong thing. Huh? Uh huh? Papa says to us, here's what he's predestinated you to be and me to be, conformed to the image of the Son, so that he may be the first begotten among many brethren. Hallelujah. Well, thank you, Jesus. Everybody, I, I want you to grab a hold of this. I want you to stand with me. Just grab a hold of this. Take it. Take a hold of the things. Somebody said, somebody said, oh, <coughs> they said, oh, just take it by faith. Well, what do you mean? Take it by faith. The faith is the new creation. The faith is to have a new heart and a new spirit. The faith is to be in Christ Jesus. The faith is to be made one with God. If you're taking it by faith that way, then amen. But if you're just taking it by faith to say, well, you know, I'm going to agree with it even though, you know, I hardly believe it. Are you listening to me? Can I say that again? I'm taking by faith. I'm going to agree with it even though I hardly believe it. That ain't going to work out. Somebody said, well, faith is a personal thing. No, it's not. It belongs to God. And he's given you and me the opportunity to participate with him. You know, leave everybody alone. They all have their personal right to their personal choices of faith. There's only one faith. There's no other faith. There's no Jewish faith. There's no Hindu faith. There's no Muslim faith. Don't go, go stealing my word. Don't go stealing my word. Get your own word, Buddhist. Don't you steal my word. Faith doesn't belong to any of your doctrines anywhere. You had to come get it out of the Bible. Huh? Get out of here. Go get your own words. Faith comes by Jesus Christ and him alone. Faith belongs to the New Covenant. It belongs to the New Testament. You don't even find it in the Old Testament. Not in the way that it's revealed in the New Testament. You find loan words, but you, you find the word trust. The faith is a New Testament thing. Don't belong to anybody but God's people. And the result of it is a new creation. The power of it to be made a new man. To be, to be made someone who belongs to God. Who's been redeemed, made a son, child of God, and is daily taught by the Holy Ghost, who belongs to heaven, whose citizenship, say, my citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Somebody said, who, what are you, who are you, where, where's your citizenship? Heaven. <laughs> One day the, the uh, police were chasing Brother Yun. He'll be here next month. They said, who are you? He said, I am the heavenly men. <laughs> now, who are you? I'm the heavenly man. Where are you from? The celestial city, heaven. They're all upset. They're getting mad. Because they call, from where he comes from, they're called the heavenly people. It was a great revival that took place in the late 1800s, early 1900s. 
They embraced fully who we are. Will you embrace fully who we are? My citizenship is in heaven. My conversation or lifestyle is in heaven. Can you, will you embrace this? Will you stop being of this world? God has empowered us. His word empowers us. When he says, be strong in the strength of the Lord, power of his might, it's not like it's some kind of rigorous command. He's empowered us. Because how are you going to figure out how to be strong like God's strong? Have his power, have his might. Give me a break. He empowered us. How do we receive the empowerment? We believe. We say, yes, oh God, that's who I am. I'm not saying I'm weak. You ain't going to find me saying I'm weak. Oh, I'm just weak. Pray for me, brother. I'm weak. You're not going to find that. I'm not gonna, you're not going to find me saying I'm weak, sick, dejected, failure, nothing like that. I'm strong. But nothing happens to the Lord say I'm sick. I'm going to stick with this. Oh, man. You, uh, you say whatever you want. You persecute me in any way you want to persecute me. I'm going with God's word because his word describes a whole other realm of living than what is men's experience in this earth. When I was, when I was younger, I was going to say when I was a young man, but when I was younger... I said to the theologian, I said, I was laying out things for him in the scripture. And he says, Mark, he says, you're right. From a biblical point of view. And this is one of the translators of the NIV, by the way. He, said, he says, Mark, you're right. From a biblical point of view, you're right. But it's not our experience. I say, forget about experience. We can't, we can't live our life based upon the experience of men. We have, to believe, we have to be willing to believe his report. That's right. If you believe his report, if you believe his report, then the armor of the Lord will be revealed to you. The power of God, in other words, the, the ability that God gives to each one of us so we can live out this life, so we can have these blessings, so we can ask and he hears and we receive. I know that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. His ears are open to their call, prayer. So I'm gonna make sure that I'm staying in the righteousness. How do I stay in the righteousness? I stay in Jesus. Amen. You and I have a privilege every day. Listen to me. You and I have a privilege, privilege every day, and we have to choose to do this, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got the privilege because we've been born again. If we haven't been born again, if we haven't been born of the Spirit, we could not do it. We have the privilege to know everything the Father has given to us because the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. But because we've been born of the Spirit, we can freely receive all that He's giving. We can be subject to Him. It's beautiful, huh? We have the privilege of being continually filled with the Spirit. But what might happen, you might just be continually filled with the world and lust and filled with your own, filled with worldly desires. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's your choice. God has given you a choice. He's liberated you to choose just like Adam cho chose. Until Christ Jesus liberated us, none of us had a choice. We were just stuck under the power and dominion of sin and death. You had the privilege of continually being baptized in the Holy Spirit. All you've got to do is choose. The more you'll do it, the more you do these things, the stronger its impact. The more you're overwhelmed by His glory. I'm telling you. I've been pastoring for over 33 years, 34 years now. I've been walking with God for the majority of my life. But there's a place I have with Him now that's nothing like it was then. Huh? You're just going to have to grow in grace and just recognize Father is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And if you want more of this, huh? you can't sit around and measure whether or not God loves you based upon whatever it is you're feeling. Huh? You can't measure how much God lo loves you based upon what kind of car you're driving. Are you listening to me? What kind of clothes you're wearing? How much money you have in the bank? Because God's measure of His love for you is far greater than all those things. Far greater. I want you to get settled. I want, we just want you to get settled, rooted, and grounded in God's love for you. And if you'll do that, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will teach you how to walk with the Father. You'll find yourself living with authority over sickness and disease. Hey, when I first started believing in divine health, I got sick almost every day, it seemed like. 
But you know what I did? I chose not to let my experience dictate to me what God's Word says. I chose to believe what God said in His Word, that I could live in divine health. And the, and the hundreds of scriptures devoted to it. And I fought a fight. I said, I, this is what I'll have. I'll have what God says. And now you're going to run against, you're going to have to run up against circumstances, men, and devils to have what God says. We don't want you to believe what you believe based upon another person. We want you to believe what you believe based upon the Word of God, what Christ Jesus did for you.